a big welcome to everybody. My name is Liam from PCPSI and I'm delighted and honoured to welcome Dr. Stephen Porges to our webinar tonight. Welcome Stephen. Well, Liam, it's a pleasure after several years finally making contact and planning our visit to join you in a few weeks. Great, and I, I really enjoyed our contact over email, so it's really great to get to see you face to face. <laughs> and, and just to say that Stephen is coming to Cork, Ireland on the 27th and 28th of September to do a workshop with Sue, Sue Carter. And, and just to get started, Stephen, just for some orientation, where are you in the world at the moment? Physically or metaphysically? <laughs> Physically. <laughs> Physically, I'm in Florida right now. I'm in a, uh, uh, at a small town called Atlantic Beach. It's outside of Jacksonville, which is the northern part of the state of Florida. But we have a home right on the ocean. And so that's, uh, we just moved there this year. So I have maintained my academic affiliations at both the University of North Carolina in the Department of Psychiatry and also at Indiana University in the Kinsey Institute. But most of the work is being done through the internet so that I can sit and watch the ocean. Nice, nice. <laughs> I could do it. I could do with some of that. I'm, I'm actually just back from the U.S. Uh -huh. I was in the U.S. for 12 days. I was in San Francisco for six days and then I traveled to Chicago and I spent another six days in Chicago. I was doing some training with a, a guy called Stephen Terrell. I don't know him. but so he, uh, he runs a training called Transforming the Experience Based Brain. Ah, uh, and so, so we used to live in Chicago. We lived there for... 12 or 13 years and this is the perfect time of the year to be there it's usually yeah. beautiful it was really beautiful really nice oh. but so to start Stephen, maybe just tell us a bit about yourself your background how you got into developing this wonderful theory the polyvagal theory well it's a good story because i'm now kind of like divulging the history of where it came from as opposed to you know most people think science is literally a programmed approach to deconstruction, when in reality, most of us who kind of discover things have intuitions and kind of a model of what we want to study and look for. And that really is our motivating, uh, that's our compass that directs us to certain things. And so I started to move the story back uh, from actually well before I was a professor and well before I was even a graduate student or even went to college and I moved it now back to what it was like to be uh, an emerging teenager in the United States okay. and, and what I was doing when I was 12 years of age I was playing the clarinet and so uh, I remember for many males regardless of whether it's the United States or Ireland or other uh, places when you become uh, come of age, your body changes and your ability to regulate your behavior changes. It becomes more difficult, you become more sensitive. And of course, you also start getting little bits of obsessive and reactivity or oppositional type behaviors because you're uh, in a child role with ideas that are starting to emerge with the passion of an adult. You have dreams and you want to live those dreams. And of course, for me, those dreams were always being constrained by the structures of institutions and the politics of wherever we live. So I was, um, put it this way, I was a, uh, uh, a bold type human being with always interesting ideas and always trying to push the envelope a little bit too far, too fast and meaning that I was not the easiest child to manage for my parents. That's what it really means. Being a father, I understand that all now. And I'm much more compassionate in retrospect uh, to my parents, uh, even though they have uh, you know, transitioned years ago, they're no longer with us. But my view of their heroic journey has been changed over the years as I understood what they were confronted with. 
And this is really the story that many of us are confronted with, which is really transgenerational traumas that impact on our society. And we basically uh, are a lot less aware of it. So when I was about 12, I was actually, um, I was playing the clarinet and I was becoming good at it. And I was practicing every day. And what I didn't real, I realized something. I realized that playing the clarinet was a wonderful, people would use words like escape, but really what it was, was a, uh, it was like, it was pranayama yoga. So it takes decades to understand that playing the clarinet with the use of the muscles of the face and head and listening and using breath is functionally pranayama yoga. So it's a major state regulator. So the exhalation that you have when you play a wind instrument is a calming uh, function. We, we know these things, but polyvagal theory actually explained why and how it works, because that's how the vagus starts to inhibit our mobilization or fight-flight systems and helps us coordinate the rest of our autonomic function so that we become socially engaging spontaneously in healthy organisms. But playing the clarinet also brings to the fore an understanding of the muscles of the face and head, including mm -hmm. muscles to listen, meaning middle ear muscles, muscles for uh, the embouchure or muscles around the mouth. Mm -hmm. And so we start using all the uh, facial muscles and the muscles that are collectively called special viscerally efferent nerves uh, that are linked in the brainstem to the regulation of the vagus. And this became the social engagement system within polyvagal theory. So basically when I was 12 years old, I was not only understanding polyvagal theory, I was implementing it as a state regulator in playing the clarinet. So if we, we start there, which is this 12 year old, and now you go through, uh, I, I played the clarinet uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, let's say, I was gonna say religiously, I don't mean to uh, use the clarinet as a religious object, but I was very structured in practicing I went off when I was about uh, 13 or 14. I, w I went to New York City weekly for my clarinet lessons, and my clarinet teacher had been the solo clarinetist in the NBC Symphony with Toscanini. So he was, in a sense, one of the finest clarinet players in the world. And I would go there weekly, and I would, he would tell me what to do. I would do it. And I had a, what one might call a transformative experience. Uh, that one day I was having my lesson, the phone rang, <clears throat> and he went to answer the phone, and he said, uh, keep playing. He came back, and he said to me, Benny said you sounded great. And Benny was Benny Goodman, the famous clarinetist, and he had heard me through the phone. So I, I always like to say now, you know, this, is, this was transformative. Uh, I didn't need to play the clarinet anymore. Um, <laughs> but I, I played in college. I was the... Uh, uh, concert master of a wind ensemble. So I played up to about the age of 20 and then basically put it away and would play with it every once in a while. I do miss it, uh, but the experience of playing the clarinet stayed with me on many levels because it got me to understanding and focusing on another, uh, which is what you do when you play in groups, whether it's the conductor or if you're playing it in quartets or ensembles you're doing lots of social engagement simultaneously. So the playing of the clarinet became uh, metaphorically what polyvagal theory was about. It was about state regulation. This also uh, intersected with another set of ideas. And that was, uh, again, going back to the turmoil of being adolescent. And that was a true understanding that if you're in certain physiological states, you're basically not worth much in the classroom. So we start understanding that there's an intervening variable between inputs and outputs, and uh, that intervening variable is our physiological state. Often it's manifested in behavioral states, we're jittery, we can't sit still. Emotional states, we're reactive, but we know that it intervenes, it's in between our ability to take in information and to process it. So that became part of this, uh, uh, it's almost like a pilgrimage and journey which was to understand that intervening variable, and then with that understanding to target 
types of strategies to regulate it, to regulate one state. And this is really why polyvagal theory at this stage of development has been so embraced by clinical clinicians because not only does it provide an explanation of the states that their clients are in, it provides uh, indications and suggestions of portals to help regulate that intervening variable to facilitate better clinical outcomes. Wow, fascinating. And you, you, <laughs> you, you've covered so much already, Stephen. And, um, and just maybe, and I know you've talked about some of the features of the theory, but maybe just to give you know a brief overview of the polyvagal theory for those that are, mm -hmm. are on the call that have no idea about it. What does what does poly actually mean? What does vagal actually mean? Maybe outline the major features of the theory. Well, uh, uh, before I start, I will tell you this is the question that I least like in any interview <laughs> because <laughs> it, it could it could be a two-hour response. Oh, it's, sure. It, it, but let me try to be uh, respectful and kind of keep it contained. Uh, polyvagal theory, first of all, is all about the, that intervening variable, that our physiological state influences how we perceive the world, how we interpret it, how we respond to others, how we communicate uh, ourselves to others. So let's start off with your real question is where the name came from. When I was developing the theory, the theory, the explanation of, of why we even need a quote poly, meaning more than one vagal theory. Vagus is the largest cranial nerve. It goes from the brainstem and influences uh, virtually all our uh, organs in the body. The vagus is bidirectional. So it, it not only sends cues from the brain to the body, but it picks up states of the body. So in a way, the vagus is the neural substrate of a brain body science or medicine or treatment model. So what uh, happened was I was working with uh, neonates, newborn babies. I was doing research. I was studying what I called vagal tone, which was a uh, pattern of heart rate that was coming from the vagus that was very protective. You, you hear about it today, people use the generic word heart rate variability, mm. but it goes back to the 1960s when I actually quantified it. I, I was the, uh, uh, the first person to quantify heart rate variability and to use it as an individual difference that could be used to predict or be related to various states and also as a dependent variable showing how it changed when we were uh, doing tasks like mental effort. So that was where my research started. But in the uh, late, or say the early 1990s, I was in a uh, confusing situation because I was trying to argue that heart rate variability, especially a component that has a respiratory rhythm or respiratory sinus arrhythmia, was a uh, sensitive index of vagal regulation of the heart. And the vagus being your, uh, the major part of the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the part of the autonomic nervous system that had been hypothetically linked to health, growth, and restoration. In a sense, your homeostatic features of autonomic function, meaning the regulation of all your organs in your body and your uh, inside your, your gut, I should say inside your visceral cavity. And so, uh, and this was, in a sense, juxtaposed to a sympathetic nervous system, which was connected to our spinal muscular system, and it was used for mobilization, and people linked that to fight or flight or stress. So you had a fight-flight stress system, and then you had this wonderful parasympathetic nervous system. And my work was really consistent with those ideas, and I was trying to argue that you could measure newborn babies. If they had more vagal tone, they would be healthier. If they had low vagal tone, they'd be vulnerable to uh, clinical problems, including apnea, where they would stop breathing, or bradycardia, where the heart rates would get too slow to support oxygenated, insufficient oxygenated blood to the brain. So one, one day, or what, at one point, I published a paper in a journal called Pediatrics. And in that journal, 
I was making the argument that this component of heart rate variability uh, was a powerful indicator that pediatricians and neonatologists should be looking at. And I received an article, back, an article, a letter back from a neonatologist that he said, he said, I enjoyed your paper, but when I was in medical school, I learned that the vagus could kill you. He said, perhaps too much of a good thing is bad. This became what I called the vagal paradox, that the vagus potentially could be lethal and the vagus could be uh, potentially protective, or, uh, as I saw. And I said, uh, this doesn't make sense to me. How can the same nerve be both, in a sense, our protector and also uh, potentially lethal to us? His comment was, perhaps too much of a good thing is bad. I didn't like that explanation. I said, that's, and I decided I went on a quest. And the quest was to figure this paradox out. So basically he said, Vegas is good, Vegas is bad. How can it be both? And the answer became relatively simple only when I start to study comparative neuroanatomy, when I started looking back through uh, the estimates of evolutionary changes. So comparative neuroanatomy or the comparative sciences are about trying to guess from living organisms what was our evolutionary heritage. So we as mammals evolved from ancient uh, reptiles or extinct reptiles. And reptiles came from amphibia and amphibia from various fish. There's a uh, developmental historical evolutionary tree. And this is really called our phylogenetic history. And as I started going and studying this phylogenetic history about our ancestors, I started to realize that when mammals evolved, something happened to the vagus. It became different. And the difference was that we got a second neural control system of the vagus. And that control system in the brain was linked to the neural regulation of facial muscles. So in a way, we all know this because we convey our physiological state in our facial expression and in our voice. And that had to do with the evolutionary survival of mammals who had to con convince conspecifics of their own species that they were safe to come close to. And that was in the intonation of voice. And today, intonation of voice means a lot more to our bodies than syntax or words. It's how you speak affects how you create relationships and whether or not you feel safe. Mothers do this intuitively, and I like to say, fathers do it very well with their dogs, but not so well with their kids. <laughs> because they, they are in a different role with their kids. They are disciplinarians usually. <clears throat> but the issue was the reason the vagus can kill you and can save you is that in mammals, the vagus with the heart rate variability with the respiratory size arrhythmia is linked to our facial expressivity and is a calming system that turns off our defenses. So in a sense, we know that if we talk with a melodic voice, our bodies relax and the people we speak to calm down. But if we talk in a low pitch voice and it becomes monotonic, we disrupt other people's feelings and they become more vigilant or sensitive to what's going on. So the real secret that came out of the box literally when, when we start to uncover this was two important points. One is the hierarchical nature of the autonomic nervous system. And the second point was the literally, I'm going to use the word, esponged or forgotten, shutting down response, defensive response of the reptilian vagus. Mm. So reptiles, when they're under life threat, they immobilize. It becomes one of their primary defense systems and they don't breathe. <clears throat> and they can hold their breath for a couple hours or they can submerge for a long period of time. But that's a privilege for a reptile because their brain is small. For humans, we have large brains and most mammals have large brains. So the ability to immobilize as a defense response is really constrained. So now we see in the neonatal intensive care unit, when the preterm baby is born, the baby's born early, they come into the world with a more of a reptilian autonomic nervous system, which has a sympathetic nervous system, which gives them the faster heart rate and defensive behaviors. But when they're overwhelmed, they shut down, they stop breathing and they have bradycardias. 
And when we go into the world of trauma, and this is where polyvagal theory yeah. got its traction, suddenly the people who were survivors of trauma said, that's what I experienced. I was social, I was traumatized, I initially became defensive, and then my body collapsed and I shut down, and I may have even passed out, or maybe I dissociated, I wasn't there anymore in my body. And many people report literally passing out, mm -hmm. and they couldn't move, they were immobilized. And suddenly, the survivor said, I now understand what my body was doing. It was trying to save me. It was making a decision. And then this shifted the whole understanding of human reactions to threat because we've been so, let's say, brainwashed to think we have only one defense system, which is a fight flight. And when we can't, in many cases, when we can't leave the situation where there's a large size differential, our bodies will automatically shut down. And when that occurs, we no longer have the opportunity to fight or to flee. The interesting part of, is the hierarchy, is that as long as we can stay mobilized, we don't shut down. Mm. Now, think about people who have shut down and what is their coping strategy. They often become hypermobilized. They exercise all the time. They exhibit high anxiety features. Their bodies are continually moving because the, once they try, once their bodies start to relax, the vulnerability comes in and the association of now immobilization with threat starts to occupy their life. So that became the model. And now where we're going with this, of course, is how do you recruit this newer mammalian vagal circuit with all the social cues because if you're a therapist focusing uh, with traumatized uh, clients, you see everything. You see the faces being flat, the affect is gone, especially the upper part of the face. You, you uh, get, uh, they have symptoms often of auditory hypersensitivity where sounds bother them, which is part of the adaptive features of the middle ear muscle when we're in dangerous situations. Their voices lack intonation and prosody. They have difficulty extracting human voice from background sounds because the background sounds are now taking priority. And then you get all these comorbidities, which at one point didn't make any sense. And the medical community called it medically unexplained symptoms or MUSE, such as ear pulled bowel syndrome, dysautonomia, fibromyalgia. And this is what happens when the organs below the diaphragm start being recruited in defense, including sexual dysfunction, which are subdiaphragmatic as well. So based on this hierarchy of our autonomic nervous system, when that newer vagus with the social engagement system is in place working, then everything else in our body works fine. If that's removed, we're in a state of mobilization or fight, flight, or defense, and that inhibits our gut because we can't metabolize the food if we're running. And then if that system doesn't serve to get us into safety, we have a last resort defensive system, which shuts us down. And that's polyvagal theory. Fascinating, fascinating, Steve. I, I'm just thinking we, we have a lot on the webinar tonight from different caregiving professions. Mm -hmm. And I think it's true to say that no matter what caregiving profession you're in, the polyvagal theory is hugely relevant. So, and I'm thinking if, you know, most caregiving professions, when we meet a client for the first time, we do it, do we do an assessment? And, and if you're looking at assessment through the lens of the polyvagal theory, what are you looking for? What information are you wanting to collect? that's going to be useful in planning treatment? What you, the first thing you do is you respect how the body's been wired. Okay. okay, and what the body tells you, what the wiring tells you is that we project the state of our heart, which means the vagal regulation of the above uh, diaphragm organs in our voice. Okay. So if our voice has good intonation, that's a vagal nerve. And if our face has good expressivity, 
it has to do with the linkage in the brainstem between the facial nerve and the nerve and the area controlling that newer mammalian vagus. If we have difficulty extracting uh, voices in background sound, if our faces are flat, if our voices lack intonation, you have a profile of a suppressed social engagement system. You don't need to put electrodes on the person. You know that their vagal regulation of the heart is low. If they start uh, to dissociate, and then you can see that even in a flatter face and the uh, posture like your head is nodding, that's linked into the brainstem with the vagus. So when the head is no longer responding and we're kind of like that, they're moving into a immobilization state that is defensive, they're dissociating. And that's physiologically different. So you ask other questions, you asked about the gut. Does the person have irritable bowel syndrome? Does the person have chronic pain? You start asking these health-related questions. Uh, you can even ask about sexual function because if the trauma is manifesting uh, as a shutting down response, the sexual function is going to differ. It's going to be challenged as well. So digestion, so everything's below the diaphragm. And the interesting part of the world is that so many people are, don't have good access to their social engagement system, but they appear to others to be successful, meaning they perform well or at a high level within their profession, but they are not creating good relationships or safe relationships, and they're highly mobilized. They become people who exercise for hours of a day. They keep moving, and they do high-risk behaviors mm. because their body is telling them one thing. If you stop doing that, you'll shut down. And so I have a projective question that I always like people to think about, and that is, what does stillness mean to you? So if stillness is some state that you'd love to be in because you can now explore yourself, your thoughts or whatever, you know, it could be spirituality or creativity. This is kind of like a, a marvelous moment where pressures are off for you, or in a stillness, is it falling into that abyss is it going, it says, are you dying? Is stillness dying to you? And I think when you work with uh, people who have trauma histories, stillness is the worst thing they can conce conceptualize. Mm. So I actually wanted to go back to one other point, and that was a different profession. So even in, even if some of the audience or people are uh, uh, watching this, even if they're the school teachers, they know the same thing. They know that the kids are dissociating and when their faces are flat. They know that when people look at you in a different way, they can't hear you. So we often say to our kids, look at us when we really mean listen to us because we're picking up that the upper part of the face is not engaged with us. Our bodies look for this information. There, in popular culture, there are wonderful songs. There's a song... Uh, that's called When There's Nothing to Say. It talks about the smile on your face, and it's about, I know your heart is meeting mine, that the words aren't necessary, and it has to do, it's totally polyvagal. Um, and there's actually another song that the people on the web might look, it's on YouTube. It's a song called Polyvagal. It was written by a songwriter called Alice Minguez, and I found it, and it's really quite amazing. It's all about violation of trust. So it's the flip side. So it's saying violation of trust. I, I and, and there's lines in it like, I can't move, someone get me out of here. And the uh, one line is violation of trust from the cradle. And those people with a severe trauma history understand that. There's no memory of a trusting relationship to help them navigate through the complexity of their world. So as a teacher, as a parent, as a therapist, if you attend to the features of the face and the voice, you will really have a lot of information about how to lead your client. Wow. And, and what do you see at the moment, Steve, as the most effective therapies for, for lowering the defenses of fight, flight, and immob immobilization? and bringing the social engagement system more online? 
Well, I've been working on this for 20 years, and I started oh, about 20 years ago trying to use a uh, acoustic uh, stimulation because of the insights from merely watching mothers. And the issue is that we're kind of like wired, our nervous system is wired to expect certain intonations of voice. We're looking for safety. We have a quest for safety. And it's not really that we learned that a mother's voice was safe. Intonation of voice triggers a sense of physiological safety in us. Okay. And those of you who have dogs or cats know the same thing. You can talk to them with a hyper melodic voice and they calm down because it's wired into their system as well. And it's all based on the physics of the middle ear structures. The physics tell us what frequencies we can get into the ear and what frequencies we need to modulate to get the, the middle ear muscles recruited. And that was part of the evolving of polyvagal theory. So I developed a acoustic intervention and I started to use it with autistic kids and was getting remarkable effects in my laboratory where the kids who had auditory hypersensitivity suddenly wouldn't have them anymore and then would be spontaneously engaging like they would look me directly in the eye and say, good morning, Dr. Porges. It was like, and this was a, with five hours of intervention. It wow. was not a conditioning study. And I thought, wow, I got it all. I figured it all out. The problem was there are two major problems. One is you don't control the environments in which kids go back into, and you don't control the clinical treatments that individuals get because in the world of autism, kids get lots of things, and it's very hard to regulate that world. So I decided I would no longer call it a treatment or deal with it as for autism, instead talk about auditory hypersensitivities because auditory hypersensitivities was really agnostic to clinical uh, diagnosis because it was in many of them. So most mental health uh, diagnosis carried with it a backstory of auditory hypersensitivities, people having difficulty processing human voice, not wanting to go to shopping malls or places where low frequencies are there, not wanting to go into social places because of, of noises. So I started to kind of model it that way and start to write about that. And I started to actually carry this intervention with me in my lab for almost 20 years. And then about two years ago, I, uh, I, I was injured, well, I met uh, people from a company called Integrated Listening Systems, and they were already uh, had a, 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 a customer base of people using auditory stimuli for treatment, primarily through uh, disciplines related to occupational therapy and speech and hearing. And they were very intrigued, and I liked them because I felt I could trust them. I was very concerned that what I had actually uncovered were really uh, the signals to the body to become safe. And I was very um, disturbed by a lot of the treatment models with autism, which were, if something works, more will be better. And so you basically exhaust and exploit a system that becomes vulnerable, and that mm -hmm. system becomes vulnerable because it wants to be supported. So I had the uh, kind of a mantra, which was less is more, because that's what the computer alterations of the acoustic signals were. So I had computer process vocal music to hyper make the music simulate hyper prosody, meaning greater intonation. So just like you can modulate uh, loudness, you can also modulate things, make them more uh, greater changes in intonation. So it was an algorithm superimposed on the music. So we uh, launched it about two and a half years ago, and now there's over 2,000 therapists have been trained to deliver this, and we've now impacted on several thousand individuals. Now, it started with children, and here's where it gets interesting but tricky. It started with children, and virtually all the children who had spectrum features, autistic spectrum features, we're getting something out of it. Reduction of or hypersensitivities, triggering spontaneous social engagement behaviors, uh, curiosity in eating food. So rather than only eating toasted cheese sandwiches and pizza, 
uh, there was a curiosity. So ingestive behaviors change. And I want to emphasize why that would change. The neural regulation of ingestion, which starts off at birth with suck, swallow, coordination of sucking, swallowing, breathing, and vocalizing, becomes as the infant being matures into a more social being, it becomes our social engagement system. So it's the same muscles of the face and head that we use for ingestion are for social behavior. And we still do that. We go out for ingestive experiences when we want to socialize. And I juxtapose that to we don't go on digestive experiences as a social experience, because that's subdiaphragmatic. But ingestion is part of our social engagement system. So you, you start seeing this uh, profile of social engagement and ingestive oral motor defensive going away and autonomic state regulation coming on because the muscles of the face, that area of the brain sends also regulating the vagus to the heart. And when that's working well, it dampens sympathetic reactivity. So you see a whole portfolio of behaviors, uh, positive behaviors coming on. And so that was fine. And we were getting wonderful results with kids. And then since I uh, talk a lot in the world of trauma, mm. the trauma people want to try this, okay? And many of the people who are therapists have a history of trauma in their own lives. And so they would get the system, they would, and they would try it on themselves. So they're, in a sense, violating a couple principles that we don't we want to always be careful about. And so what I started to realize was uh, that many of the people who had trauma histories when they would listen to the music of safety, the, basically the essence of safety, their bodies would become very, very destabilized. And we have to think about what happens uh, to a person who survives trauma. It's all about a violation of trust. And when are we trusting? We're trusting when our bodies feel safe. We are vulnerable and accessible. Now the body starts becoming vulnerable and accessible and what's the brain's association? That's when I got hurt. That's when I was violated. And the bodies react. And the reaction is, I got to get the hell out of here. And it's either going to be a state of anxiety or it's going to be destabilization of their ability to regulate the state. Now, with kids, we never had any of this. And then I started to deconstruct this. We were calling this intervention the safe and sound protocol. Oh, yeah. And what was really serendipitous in creating the title is that there were two components. It wasn't merely the sounds, it was the safe context, as it is as important as the sounds. And when you bring a child into a clinic, the child's coming with an adult, and another, another, and there's a, another adult, a clinician. So the child is contained in a safe environment to experience this release of hypervigilance and defensiveness. But when an adult comes for a treatment, they're coming by themselves. And they come into the room and then they have to leave. They have to become vigilant again. So we've been saying now, trying to explain the importance of having someone with you or a pet and for the therapist to become more and more aware of the client's potential destabilization. And initially, everyone who wanted to do this, especially with trauma history said, I want to do this and I'll just, you know, power, power through it, which would, is the worst thing. The most important thing is to be respectful and self-compassionate of one's own body's reactions to it. So part of the training now is to, to allow people to become aware of what's happened to them with this. And then it's kind of like a somatic experiencing model where you experience the physiological response that resolves and you can have more of this uh, exposure. And it's not an exposure model, it's a neural exercise model, because what you're doing is recruiting neural circuits that provide you with resilience. So the coming back to your initial question, I think there's tremendous power in the acoustic channel. It's not the only one. Mm. And I think that the acoustic channel can functionally be used to regulate state to facilitate other pathways or portals for therapy. And right now we're treating, actually I'm running a study, and we'll be running studies where 
the acoustic stimuli are being used as an acoustic vagal nerve stimulator to kind of maintain state. And I'm doing that on a couple clinical conditions. One is with people with irritable bowel syndrome to see if we can treat them with the acoustic stimulation. And the other one is the G gastroenteral GI problems associated with disorders such as Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is hypermobility. It's where joints are double jointed, but people who have those symptoms have fibromyalgia, have high levels of anxiety and severe gut problems. And what I'm trying to find out is whether we can uh, selectively treat some of those comorbidities uh, that may have been uh, triggered by the signals of the disorder and not really the disorder itself. So you can still have hypermobility, but can we get rid of or reduce the symptoms regarding autonomic function? Wow, fascinating, Steve. Fascinating. We're going to have fun. We're looking. <laughs> <laughs> I just before we continue, Steve, I I have a few questions that people sent in by email and I'd also encourage anybody else on the call if they want to send in a question please do so I'll, I'll just read out these questions just two here Steve um, the first question is how does polyvagal theory illuminate the way in which unconscious experiences of safety danger and life threat become woven into, into personal narrative? Okay. It, 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 okay, perfect question, because when we have the polyvagal theory, we start being able to understand our body's reactions. Now, our body reacts to cues in the environment of which we are not aware of, but we are aware of our bodily feelings so that if uh, something happens, a cue in the environment triggers a defense in my body, my vagal regulation is going to be dampened and my sympathetics may start going up. I'll be aware of that change and that change will affect my perception of the world. It'll be biased towards more greater negativity. But if I'm aware of my body's change, I can now temper the narrative. I can control the narrative. I can basically say, I'm my body's feeling this way, I'm not really upset with Liam. So, uh, so we start explaining why our body, uh, why we feel not so good, we don't blame the other. And this becomes one of the major issues there. Are. What I've been now saying is that there's no reason why people should ever argue because th there's no resolution of an argument. No one wins it. There, there's not a winning of an argument and the arguments are merely, we're too uh, individuals are organisms that are supporting their defenses and making a narrative to justify why they need to be aggressive to, to protect themselves. But the narrative is never going to work. So what we need is a reflective narrative that starts to help us understand why we feel a certain way without attributing causality to the person or something else that's happened in the day. So we become more self-compassionate and more aware of what changes in our physiological state can do to disrupt our, be our behaviors with others. Well, thanks, Steve. I, uh, the next question I think is fascinating. Um, so I'll try to get it all in. So, so what happens from a polyvagal perspective when caregivers are abusive, neglectful or misattuned on a continuous basis and as a result an infant regularly is triggered into mobilization with fear and our immobilization with fear mm. and it, what you might specifically address number one is around age so the younger that this happens is it likely to have more of a profound effect the second then, in this case, does the nervous system lose its reciprocal relationship? And the third then, is it likely that the infant will eventually stay in some combination of fight, flight, immobilization, and when they get triggered in the future, 
it's deeper into the spectrum of fight, flight, immobilization they go and has this the potential to explain the more serious mental health diagnosis? Well, the answer is yes. And so what we're, we're really saying is that let's put diagnoses away for a while. Let's talk about underlying processes. Okay. And let's start thinking about the brainstem as a regulator of physiological state. And if we don't have good brainstem regulation of physiological state, we have emergent properties that we call mental health and behavioral problems. Mm. So it's like, uh, this is the building block. And this is not the way that most people in uh, mental health or let's say psychiatry or psychology would think of it because they have not been really focused on state regulation. Um, and state regulation is really about, can the body feel safe in itself and in a place with others? Because everything is about, you know, we focus on, on what we call self-regulation, which is real, and we minimize the importance of co-regulation, mm. where self-regulation uh, comes from. So this was the earlier part of the question, when the infant has a co-regulator, which is the responsibility of the mother, and the father and the other caregivers, if this is not occurring, the child has to figure out self-regulatory strategies, which are going to be crying themselves to sleep or mobilizing it at a chronic level. Uh, my colleagues who work with foster children, children who are removed from biological parents, have great, time, great difficulty in uh, having, let's say, more permanent adjustments because these kid children do not have mental images of safety. So when you have, let's say, a good parenting, let's say for a year or two, mm -hmm. there are mental images of a blissful moment. But for many of the children removed from biological parents, they don't have any moments. So they don't have a narrative that can, they can use to help them, a personal narrative that helps them navigate through difficult times. And I think that's really a major issue in the foster care programs around the world. And because the moments of feeling safe for these children is very, very minimal. Mm -hmm. And the consequences are really a bias in all social interactions of being more negative. So if our body doesn't feel safe, we will detect cues that are not dangerous as if they were dangerous. We will be very conservative in our response. It's like if people, you may have seen this or had this in your life, where uh, your face may have gotten flat because you're kind of like shocked at something, mm. and someone will yell at you and say, why are you angry at me, or something of that order. Because the body's taking, their body is taking your neutral expression as if it's negative, it's a bias. Or if someone is reflexively kind of smiling and they say, wipe that grin off your face. So they become these adaptive responses within our culture and they are often misunderstood as intentionality. And I guess this is one of the most important parts of polyvagal theory. It starts to explain many of our behaviors as not being intentional, but being emergent based on our physiological state. It doesn't give up our responsibility because we can be aware of our physiological state. And then we have to learn the pathways to help regulate our own states. And some of those pathways go back to uh, the intuitive knowledge of playing the clarinet. So if you exhale slowly, you take a deep breath, you use diaphragmatic breathing, the exhaling slowly puts the vagus back on, on circuit. It starts working and starts downregulating the sympathetics. So a slow exhalation is calming, while a long inhalation and rapid exhalation is mobilizing. And you can see this in your clients. Their breathing patterns will shift when they get upset. Their muscles will shift. And you can see the whole defensive tone coming back in their body. And a slow exhalation allows that vagus to come back on. So part of therapy is all about empowering the client to help them regulate their bodily state. But they have to be aware of their bodily state and be more embodied to experience what's going on. Yeah, yeah, it kind of, it brings up an interesting idea around the idea of choice. 
do, do, do we have choice before we're aware of our physiological states and have some control? Well, well we have certainly choice after we become aware of it. Yeah. And it's almost like a metaphor. Uh, it's like you're, you're in your body, it's like luggage. And if your body starts going into a certain state, do you want to act it out in the most negative of terms or do you want to protect it and say, maybe I'll sit down in the room and I'll relax for a few minutes and I'll take some breathing and then I'll be fine. Uh, or are you going to use the energy that's coming to you when you get scared or mobilized and act out on someone else? And I would say the latter one is what's most common. People, in a sense, exploit the energy that's coming because in a way their bodies, when they're destabilized and they don't have a good social engagement system, it's going to oscillate from being this aggressive, mobilized one to being a a victim, which is now shutting down and withdrawing. So they're going to go back and forth. They're going to give cues of aggression. And when those aggressive cues stimulate aggressiveness in the other, they're going to say, what are you yelling at me for? I'm just, you know, the, because their physiological state will shift. And now they're, they'll see themselves as victim. Mm. So it, it's quite interesting. I, I do an exercise of just having people shift the ratio of inhalation to exhalation and have them look at each other and tell me what they see in each other. It's really quite remarkable because when they have long exhalations, they'll look at someone and they'll say, oh, I'd really like to get to know that person. When they shift it the other way, they say, what, am I doing it wrong? Am I breathing wrong? So they see the other person as evaluative in one case, and in one case, very accepting. And the interesting part is as the observer, your mirroring or the facial expression, which is changing with breathing, is bouncing off of you as the observer, and you're now getting defensive or, or feeling welcomed. So we are so unaware of these little subtle things that our bodies evolved to have, to send cues to others that we are safe to come close to. Great. Okay, thanks, Steve. There's, there's four questions after coming in. Can you see them from your side? Oh, can I see questions? No, yeah. I don't see them. I, I just see you. <laughs> uh, I, can, I can call them out. Okay. Um, wait, a minute. I, wait a minute. I can click on that. Maybe that comes out if I click. Yeah, I can see it. Oh, okay. okay. Okay, now. Uh, okay, so uh, this is about a head injury with rugby and a squash racket smashed in the eye, later diagnosed with hemifacial spasm and involuntary movement around the eye mouth, but after 28 years being treated with Botox to muscle relax, 10 year, uh, 10 year, 10 year young child swung around neck and something released the muscle and neck and somehow moved and cleared. So no treatment cures. This could be connected to releasing some stress or polyvagal system connecting the movement. So what Martin is saying is that uh, he was using Bo Botox, uh, knocks out the muscles, so it's around the eye and mouth. Okay, so here's the, here's the answer to his question. Um, with the neck movement, it is very possible that his neck was causing some compression on the nerves going to the face and the muscles around the eye. So the mouth and the eyes. And it's very possible that his explanation is, is the correct one. He's saying about connected to releasing stress. It's really about taking pressure off the nerves. In this case, it would be the facial nerve and the movement of that on, on that face, on the, those muscles. So it's quite possible. I just don't, you know, I, I, would, I can't say any more than that. yes, it's possible. Okay, then we, we have how to leave, this is from Christina, how to leave the frozen collapse trauma mechanism, what's the treatment protocol? This is, this is where my colleagues, like people in, like Pat Ogden and Peter Levine, this is what the world is all about. It's about working with people who have had those experiences. Polyvagal theory explains how you get there and also explains what are the portals to getting out of there. The portals about getting out of there is the body has to be in a safe state. So and this has to be negotiated between therapist and client. Um, 
in a dialogue of, of con spatial context or proximity and an intonation. So when the client's body starts to feel safe, then there's a spontaneity of these systems normalizing themselves. So the optimistic aspect of polyvagal theory is that if our body feels safe, it will start normalizing a lot of these attributes. So it means that the portal is really a portal of getting the body to be in a state of safety and then access to these uh, circuits changes. So they no longer carry their, their threat or their potential injury to the individual. Uh, the next question is from Marie. And does Dr. Porges have any opinions or ideas on how collective trauma impacts on a society? In Ireland, we have experienced trauma over generations through colonization, the great hunger, clerical abuse, which are just a few examples. For example, uh, are there collective responses to trauma based in the autonomic nervous system? Well, I'm going to say that absolutely. And I was, uh, you know, the part of the whole whole story of humanity is that humans are traumatized species. So we start with the notion that we are traumatized or have been traumatized. And we now are learning about not merely collective trauma, but transgenerational trauma and how this gets conveyed across generations in terms of our culture and our experiences. And also it, it kind of emphasizes to me our are really our innate quest to become safe and what it is that our body really wants. So the uh, part of what I'm saying is gets embedded in our autonomic nervous system as uh, we have to be hypervigilant because we're not safe. This gets translated into mobilization. It gets translated very nicely and easily into a capitalistic worldview. We need to acquire stuff because no one else will take care of us. So the whole culture that all of us live under is really impacted by the trauma. And we, I wonder what life would be like in terms of the creativity if we could remove, uh, if we had a concept, that the concept of safety was embedded in our culture, not just the concept of threat. We are bombarded with the notion that threat is everywhere and our job in life is to minimize threat. Our job in life is of course to minimize threat, but much more important, our job in life is to present cues of safety to those who are close to us. And we kind of miss that. We miss that in, in the US, it's about arming schools. So schools no longer feel safe. It's about uh, people feeling just unsafe all the time. And even though this works in a certain model by keeping people mobilized or more productive, which is that model, it does not create a society in which people are supportive of each other, compassionate, collective, and even creative and bold. So uh, I totally agree that uh, their trauma lives in our autonomic nervous system. And I would like to say that the most important thing in our way that we manage our life is to attempt to keep our defenses out of our autonomic nervous system. Because when our autonomic nervous system is not vulnerable to going into states of defense, we're happier and healthier, more creative and more interesting. We are a more interesting and creative species. And the final question is from Raymond. Oh, we're getting more. Raymond, thanks to heroes and scientists like yourself, a great proportion of the professionals today are aware of the mechanism of trauma, but the world seems to remain asleep. How can we better raise awareness now? Could the people with the knowledge and credibility, such as your, yourself, respectfully show a little more emotion in order to instill the necessary outrage to bring about change? So that's an interesting one. Some of my colleagues are totally outraged, and they, I think, Outrage stimulates outrage in others. And it, in a sense, although it's well merited in the case, but it also tends to block communication in certain uh, arenas. So I try to talk more in terms of a optimistic port portal or pathway in which physiological state is available to be uh, soothed and made to feel safer. And when you do that, the emergent properties are a more a connected and supportive society. 
So I'm just trying to get people to think that the world will benefit more by feeling safe and comfortable with each other than enforcing more cognitive uh, uh, cognitive units down our brain. So it's more than just uh, learning. We need to, in a sense, learn, to, uh, or not necessarily learn, we need to experience friendship and playfulness with each other. So there's another one I need to carry. I'm currently working with a client who has previously been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. I've seen her four times. Your presentation tonight has allowed me to be more empathic towards her. It has so far been a difficult experience for me as a therapist, as her way of engaging me is dismissive, that I am not enough and yet too much. Uh, my new learning is that she isolates between hypervigilance and shutdown with no access to ventral vagal. She has no interest in any chance uh, of okayness. So what she is, so I actually came up with a concept that I call polyvagal syndrome. And when people get into one of the stages, they actually oscillate between being actively defensive and uh, shifting between submissive victim and actively defensive, which is really shifting from a sympathetic fight flight to a more dorsal vagal immobilization, why are you hurting me? And both those attributes become very vulnerable, both the ventral, uh, the dorsal vagal or shutting down and the sympathetic fight flight become very uh, accessible when the social engagement system is not running the show. When the social engagement system is running the show, you have access to the mobilization part of the sympathetics, but it's contained by your social behaviors. Think about uh, team sports or playing, or even think about dogs chasing each other. When they catch each other, they turn and make sure they have face-to-face -face eye contact, and then they roll reverse. Because they need the social engagement to make give them cues that this is play and not an aggressive act. We need cues from each other all the time that this is not aggressive. We're looking for people's face-to-face -face eye contact and that will make us feel safe. Too often in our world, we're not getting enough face-to-face -face due to, quote, social networking or social media where we're using computers or, or smartphones for our, our major social interaction when our bodies say, give me some voice, give me some face, give me some gestures so that I can co-regulate. Okay, Steve, I, I think we're on the time, unfortunately. Well, well thank you, Leanne. I'm looking forward to visiting and uh, being yeah. part of your program. Totally. I, I'm very much looking forward to meeting yourself and to meeting Sue. And just to say again, for anybody that's not signed up, the workshop is on the 27th and 28th of September. There's some places left, but not many. So please sign up if you want to go. And I look forward to you coming a few days early and we'll see a bit of Cork and a bit of Kerry, Steve. Yeah, well, I also tell you, I think I mentioned that Sue's mother's family comes from the area around Cork. So this is going to be interesting for oh, her. Great. Oh. Okay, talk to you oh. soon, Steve. And great. Like just to like to thank everyone that's been on the webinar tonight and hopefully we'll see people in September. Yeah, well, thank you. Looking forward to seeing you live face to face uh, with head nods, head gestures, facial expression and vocalizations. Thank you very much. Lee. Thank you, Steve. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.